Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's Fresh Take featuring Dr. Gregory Washington. I'd like to do, introduce our host, our CEO, J.B. Holston. Thanks very much, Jenna, uh, as always, and welcome, everyone. And uh, welcome, Dr. Gregory Washington. It's great to have you on the, uh, on the conversation. Thanks so much for joining us. Great to be here. Thanks. Uh, for folks who don't know, Dr. Gregory Washington became Mason's eighth president on July 1, 2020, right smack in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, Greg was formerly the dean of the Henry Samuel School of Engineering at the University of California, Irvine, and former interim dean of the College of Engineering at Ohio State University. He's regarded nationally as a strategic and collaborative solutions oriented leader who's committed to providing opportunities for students of all backgrounds. I can absolutely personally attest to all that from uh, our uh, time together as colleagues, as, co as deans in various uh, uh, different institutions. A uh, little bit more about Greg, for those of you who don't know him. Uh, he recruited and hired one of the most diverse engineering faculty cohorts in the country at Irvine with more than 40% of his 60 hires being women or from underrepresented groups. He's raised more than hundred million in public and private philanthropy for the engineering school. He was the first African-American Dean of Engineering in any University of California campus and the first African-American president at Mason. Uh, Greg established an office of access and inclusion at UCI to enhance campus life for all students, and chaired the task force on ensuring a positive climate for the campus's black community. Greg is a renowned researcher. He's conducted research for NSF, NASA, General Motors, the Air Force Research Labs, the US Army Research Office, among others. He served as a member of the US Air Force Scientific Advisory Board, the NSF Engineering Advisory Committee, the Institute for Defense Analysis, the Octane Board of Directors and other boards. Uh, Greg is also past chair of the Engineering Dean's Council of the American Society for Engineering Education and a fellow of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. So once more, Greg, thanks again for joining us and welcome. Thank you, it's great to be here. Great, so we've got a long list of things to, uh, to talk about, Greg, mm -hmm. and I suspect you and I could probably go on all day uh, catching up, but let's start a little bit about, um, about your background. I didn't, I didn't tell everyone the full story about uh, you know, where you started, but if you would take a couple of minutes and talk a little bit about um, what brought you to engineering? What was the path that took you to engineering? Well, for me, you know, I believe I was born with the engineering spirit, to be totally honest with you. Um, as a youth, I would always take all of my toys apart. <laughs> and, and for those of you parents listening, for if you if you have a destructive kid, there actually may be hope for them. You know, um, uh, Christmas time, you get new toys. By New Year's, mine were all taken apart, and components in one toy was connected to another. And my my my, my mother tells me the story where she literally thought something was wrong with me, and she was asking one of her friends, and it, and and and. and uh, the woman told her, she said, I don't think there's anything wrong with your son. I think he's probably an engineer or a scientist. That's great. And, and that started that uh, bug, thought. It's been a part of me since I was a little kid, you know, it, with, with my mother telling me these things. And, uh, you know, I wind up going to engineering school at NC State and, uh, you know, I, because I'd fallen in love with engineering, but very, very interesting. And, and I actually, uh, I knew I wanted to be an engineer when I turned down football scholarships and athletic scholarships to schools because they didn't have engineering programs. Yeah. And no school with an engineering program would offer me a scholarship to play <laughs> sports. So, so I wound up as a student, right? And uh, a, a group of us had complained to the dean uh, that we were having problems understanding our TAs in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was sophomore year. I'm in the dean's office with a group of about eight other students. And we're giving the, the dean our complaints. And he talks with us for a while. And on the way out, he taps me on the shoulder and he pulls me back in the room. And I'm like, oh, my God, <laughs> I'm getting ready to get kicked out of school. But he pulls him back in the room and he says, look, I've seen your grades. You can either be part of the problem or part of the solution. I can guarantee you that if you go on and pursue a PhD in engineering, you will not pay a dime if you do it here. Hmm. And I said, okay, I took him up on the offer and went through, got my PhD and the rest is kind of, it's kind of history. Yeah. 
that's a great that's a great story, particularly that kind of timely mentoring and conversation. Uh, yeah, it's a, oftentimes it doesn't happen often enough. That's for that's for sure. Well, well, interesting enough, what it taught me is the power of someone's suggestion and the power of engagement that you can have on youth. And, and I've always tried to practice that as a dean, to literally go out and touch students and engage them and talk with them because you never know where that seed is, you know, you know where that fertilizer is gonna fall. Yeah. And that person might germinate into an individual like myself or individual, like, you know, you'd be surprised how many others have had th this spark put into them by some individual who tapped them on the shoulder at a relatively young age and said, you know, I think there's a different path for you. Yeah, uh, that, that, that's terrific. Let's, I do wanna talk about um, Mason and life in the pandemic and, and how y'all thrived through that. Um, but let's talk a little bit about the transition from Irvine to, to Mason. And yeah. I know it's tough to separate out from the pandemic, but you know, for folks who are listening who may not know both institutions, how do you, how do you, now that you've been in this for, for, you know, 50 or 20 years in, in, in <laughs> dog years, um, how do you, how do you think about, or how should folks think about those two different institutions? What are similar, what's different? So I came here from the University of California, Irvine. And what people don't realize is UC Irvine is George Mason 10 years ago. Uh, when I arrived to UC Irvine, it was ranked as the number one institution under 50 years old. And, and UC Irvine is now 54, 55 years old, something like that. Uh, do you know the top institution under 50 years old right now? That's George Mason University. Mm. And uh, both are very diverse, which is what drew me to both. Uh, but George Mason is more of what we would call an access institution. Um, George Mason is provided to provide an opportunity to those many in, to those individuals that many institutions would overlook. Uh, UCI was a highly selective uh, institution and grew more and more selective over time. Uh, and, and, and so that difference also attracted me. Uh, it's a uh, it, it's a place that's really given people opportunities and. Uh, and if we can continue to give people great opportunities and continue our ascent to being a great institution, that combination, I think, is just fantastic. Yeah. You and I spoke a little bit before we started this, um, Greg, about the last 10 months and about uh, leading through the pandemic. Um, your population, uh, generally speaking, of students in particular and their families was was particularly hard hit. Um, and I know... I know you're a big believer in and an advocate for and a champion of experiential learning. You know, suddenly everything's different. Um, talk a little bit about some of the things you did with the team at Mason to manage through the institution. And if you wouldn't mind, maybe some of the risks that you had to take, some of the decision taking risks you had to take. Well, uh, coming into the pandemic, we had two major decisions to make. And that's what is the campus going to look like throughout the academic year, meaning are, are, were we gonna have any students on campus or not? You know, at that time, most of the institutions in our region had decided to not have yeah. any students formally on campus. Uh, so that was the first decision. The second decision was uh, what we were gonna do with our faculty and staff. Uh, on average, we got about 68, Hundred to 7,000 dorm rooms on campus, right? Uh, and, 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 and I mean, dorm beds. If you think about it from that perspective, uh, each one of those beds generates somewhere in the neighborhood of about $12,500 for the institution. And so you're looking very close to a $100 million loss with no students on campus. I think that's, those are the numbers we're looking at. Yeah. Uh, and I don't care how efficient an institution you are, if you pull a hundred million dollars out of that institution, <laughs> you're going to have to make dramatic cuts and reductions. And, uh, and, and so we asked the question, could we be safe? Could we bring students back to campus and do it safely, given that a pandemic was literally raging around us? That was the first risk. And if we could 
do it safely, then we can maintain a large number of our faculty and staff. And if we couldn't, we were gonna to have to have significant cuts uh, to faculty and staff. And so the two decisions were, we were gonna bring back half of our students and, and so that we can de-densify and make it work. And we were going to maintain jobs. We were not gonna go through uh, significant cuts. Those were the two big decisions. Now, in order to execute on that, we, we had to keep those students safe, right? The major outbreak amongst uh, those students would mean uh, we would then have to shut down. There would be substantially more cost in doing that and you would still lose, you'd have to refund those students that money and you would still lose the 100 million you were gonna lose up front, right? So it would actually be a higher cost at, for, for, for failure. Our people came together. We we figured it out. We managed this process really well. We you know we our uh, for an institution of thirty eight thousand well right now close to forty thousand students uh, for us to have somewhere in the neighborhood of three hundred eighty three cases now uh, since January um, that that's a big deal. We literally right now we have. Uh, even going into graduation, we had one case. So we, we were able to manage this and manage it quite well. We were able to maintain a great environment for our students who were on campus, you know, not as much engagement as they would have liked, but we, they were able to engage safely. And we were able to do all of that while, while maintaining integrity of our faculty and staff. And, and so I, I, I you know, it, 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 I learned a lot about my staff during this process. I learned a lot about our faculty during this process because we all had to come together and work together in order to make it work. Uh, we did in a significant way. And, and that gives us confidence that we can tackle the big challenges and big problems that are in front of us. Yeah. Well, congratulations on that. I know um, how risky all those decisions were at the time. Not only was there no roadmap, but as you mentioned, a lot of your peer institutions were were not willing to take either of those main main risks. Uh, sure. And yeah, so uh, so kudos to you and and great for the region. You know, I just I think that uh, keeping momentum through all of this for your institution was a was a big highlight for the region. So congratulations on that, Greg. Um, as we as we come out of this, let's. Uh, Let's talk about a couple of things. One is I'd like to start at the highest level and then we can move down. But if you think about things learned, there's been a lot of conversation in higher ed circles about, you know, what do we learn through the pandemic? Um, you know, what can we institutionalize for the long term, et cetera? How are you how are you thinking about that? What do you think the institution learned that they're going to want to implement for the long term differently for, uh, through the pandemic? Well, <laughs> you're you're a former academic. So so so, so you know this. The, the biggest revelation, the, the, the one that was, it's a little comical uh, uh, to some extent, but I, I can kind of sum it up in one word, or, or in one sentence. We learn that the students want to be together on campus. We've learned that. So in the end, coming out of this, I can tell you that students want to be together on, they want to come to campuses, they want to uh, be in their dorm rooms and be a part of that vibrancy of campus life. But they don't necessarily want to do it in class. They don't necessarily <laughs> want to be in class, yeah. right? Uh, they will consume that information virtually. Uh, they will consume that information online. Uh, you know, they don't feel that they should have to tolerate an 8 a.m. class on a Monday morning or, they, or an 8 a.m. class on Friday or 6.30 p.m. class on Friday. They, it's like, you know, why can't I have that class online? And so flexibility is a watchword for us going forward uh, in order to be able to accommodate it, uh, those students. We're, we are gonna have what's a, a very, very hybrid flex-like schedule going forward. We'll have a, a lot more in-person classes without question. Uh, but we are going to exploit as much as we possibly can the utilization of uh, virtual classes. It just makes it makes a lot of sense. It's also, given that we're an R1 institution, it's the best thing for our faculty. Think about it. Um, if you're managing a large research program and you have you teach on Tuesday and Thursdays 
and you got a major sponsor that wants to come in on Thursday, you can have your students consume their class virtually on that Thursday so that you can meet with your sponsors. You literally can record the lecture on Wednesday, give it to the students on Thursday at their normal class time and continue working and not miss a beat. And uh, our, our students are, more, are so digitally ready and so digitally accommodative that that's, that's okay. Even for those students who want to have the more personal interaction of face-to-face. -face. So uh, you, you're going to see a different environment going forward. That cat is out of the bag. That's the biggest lesson I think coming out of this, but you're not gonna see fully online programs. I just think that the, the other side of that lesson was learned too. And that is, that's actually not what students want. Yeah. You know, I, I know uh, faculty were very hesitant about the pace at which and the magnitude of having to move online. But I do think that a lot of people, faculty and staff too, were looking at a more hybrid future and thinking that could be more accommodative to them too, as you point out. Yeah. Uh, oh my God, you can't believe. So look, uh, so I went through the faculty, uh, Senate minutes of previous years, and there was this real fight. George Mason was really looking at developing a significant uh, virtual presence. Mm -hmm. I mean, a significant a la Arizona State University, a la University of Phoenix, Purdue Global. They were really looking in that direction, and it was met with real resistance from the faculty. They just did not want to go online. They did not want to go virtual. And it was this cohort of people who were staunchly against it. Pandemic hits, we literally go virtual overnight. Then we start talking about, you know, we're gonna come back. We're gonna bring you all back. And that same group of faculty who were pounding the tables, we don't want this. <laughs> <laughs> that same group of faculty is now, we don't want to get back in the classroom. <laughs> we don't want to do face to face. We want to do virtual. It, it, it's it was amazing to see the flip, you know. Yeah, well, it'll um, those Senate meetings. You can call. You can hold up the old minutes and say, "Look, <laughs> that's right. You you actually want it. Yeah, your name right here. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's great. Um, let's talk a little bit. I want to dive in a little bit on STEM, STEM education, diverse pipelines uh, in the region. But talk. Let's talk first about the region. Uh, for those who, again who aren't quite as steeped in higher ed. You know, clearly one of the great strengths of the region is the strength of the higher ed ecosystem throughout uh, throughout this region. Region, it's just remarkable. I've certainly um, you know become to appreciate that even more uh, having come here. You mentioned GMU as an access university. Uh, Mason is an access university. Talk a little bit about how when you're when you're trying to characterize where uh, Mason fits in this higher ed ecosystem. How do you how do you how do you explain it? How do you talk about what what differentiates it? Yeah, so it's a, that's a real good question. Look. Uh, a, size and scale. That's what we bring to the table that others know. Um, we will exceed 40,000 students this year and 70% of them take jobs in the DMV, yeah. period. So for a company looking for talent, it, you know, Mason is in that equation without question and in almost every major and discipline. The other piece is we're the most diverse institution in the region. We have as many African-American students as any institution in Virginia, and that includes our HBCUs. And we have more Latinx students than any institution in the region by a significant margin, and that's our whole region. Uh, we're also the most innovative and flexible institution in the region with more degree programs than any other institution in our state. And we are one of the most aggressive institutions actually in the Greater Washington Partnership. So you. You, you know, the programs and the initiatives that you put in place between universities and industry, Mason is uh, always core at that and one of the more aggressive universities in, in, in terms of ex, uh, expanding and exploiting those partnerships. And, you know, and that's, that's what being an access institution puts you in a position to do, right? Because ultimately you are trying to provide opportunities for those 40,000 students, right? I, I don't have a small cohort of people yeah. that I can craft and in, 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 in that I have time to worry about, uh, you know, onesie twosie type opportunities. I literally have to put in place mechanisms that find opportunities for massive numbers of individuals who are graduating. Yeah. 
Um, along those lines, you've you know you've made some some big moves. Uh, you've you're, you've got a school of computing. Yes. Uh, launching. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, about um, the background of that, if you would. Uh, some of your aspirations for it. Obviously, you've got a lot going on in Arlington as well, and I know there's there's a direct intersection between those. But uh, let's talk about those. So, um, look, uh, we have a goal to get to fifteen thousand computer science and engineering graduates over the next two decades. From an enrollment perspective, we're going to be at that number in five years. And, uh, and so what we did this year is we formed the College of Engineering and Computing. And under it, we have two schools. One is the School of Computing. The other is the Volginal School of Engineering, uh, which was the Volginal School of Engineering was already in existence at Mason for a number uh, of years. Uh, we established in Arlington our Institute for Digital Innovation, and that institute would actually house the School of Computing, but it, it, but it will incorporate so much more. Um, uh, that facility that we're putting in place is foundational to the innovative ecosystem, in my opinion, of the whole region, with the goal of shaping what our future digital society looks like. Um, it'll be a convener of startups. Uh, rapid, rapidly growing middle market companies, uh, high tech large companies, and, uh, and and at its basis in terms of its operation is what we call cyber physical systems. That's its intellectual basis. And stemming from that are specific emphasis in areas like healthcare informatics, cybersecurity, uh, 5G, cloud, quantum computing, autonomous vehicles, machine learning, and fintech. Right. So these are the things that kind of grow out of that cyber physical system framework that we're putting in place. And we've already started bringing partners on board to our facility that we're putting in Arlington. We currently have, we're currently, that facility there, even though it's not fully built, we've actually uh, taken uh, space that we already own there and reconfigured, actually totally redesigned that space to accommodate tenants who want to get in there early uh, it's now home to the Cyber Security Manufacturing Innovation Institute, or CIMANI, and the Commonwealth Cyber Initiative are both now located on that, on that space. And we have 32 industry and community partners who are working with us on the actual development of that whole region. So it's not going to just be a building. We are actually going to, in combination and concert with our partners, develop that whole corridor of Arlington and have it have a uh, innovation and digitization focus. Uh, we, we get asked this by a lot of the partner companies, uh, Greg, and I'm sure you do as well, but how do you, how do you differentiate um, or, or how should people think about the whole um, Virginia Tech Innovation Campus Initiative relative to, uh, to that work that you were just describing? So it's interesting, you know, the, the reality is, um, we haven't done enough work together, Virginia Tech and Mason, to kind of carve out specific niches for, in, for each institution. Uh, but there are some natural ones that are bubbling up. Virginia Tech it has really carved out a space where they are working with and supporting a lot of the larger companies in the region. We have some of those but we have carved out a space where we are working with a significant number of smaller and mid-market companies, companies like Appian and Alarm.com and MicroStrategy and Cvent and Clarabridge. Uh, and, and then we have the startup community with our incubators, which we have three in the area, uh, with our incubators and our uh, small business development centers, which we manage all 33 in the state. Uh, we are actually providing a ecosystem backbone to create the next large company. So our goal is out of this, can Virginia be the hub to the next Amazon? Can we be the hub to the next Microsoft, to the next large major tech company? We think we have a chance of being able to do that, but that requires you having a convener, you having an infrastructure, you having an actual ecosystem to help promote and support that, that's our focus and that's the direction we're going with this. 
Yeah. And that's a differentiator, to be totally honest with you. Yeah. You know, when we were setting up CoLab, and you folks have been a key partner in that since we started, but when we were setting it up, our friends at McKinsey did some work to look at the gap analysis for uh, talent, for digitally skilled talent in the region. And one of the things we keep telling folks is, you know, that gap is huge and it's not closing quickly. So you know, even if we all threw everything we had at trying to close it through initiatives like yours, the Innovation Campus, we still wouldn't wouldn't close it. Uh, and so, you know, there, there's plenty of room from our point That's of view. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. not, not just plenty of room for us in Virginia Tech, there's plenty of room for other partners too. Yeah. And so uh, this is not a, and, and, and that's one of the reasons why I, I really haven't, you know, tried to emphasize we should do this and they should do that. The, the reality is, both institutions should do what they feel they do best, coexist, work together uh, when necessary, and compete when necessary. I, I call the concept coopetition, <laughs> right? You figure out when you're going to work together, and you figure out when you're going to compete. And it's okay uh, to both work together and compete. You don't have to be mortal enemies. You can actually be friends and work together on some things and be competitors on others. No, no, no question. Uh, you, you've been a pioneer on, um, as we talked about in the introduction, Greg, on STEM diversity. Um, but if you look at some of the recent reports, it may have been AAU that came out with this last week. It was quite recent about, um, I think maybe it was Pew uh, that was restating. But at any rate, you know, we haven't made the progress at the pace in terms of either women in the field or underrepresented groups that I know the engineering disciplines in particular for the last 15, 20 years have really set out to, to achieve. As you look at things now, what, why is it still not, um, why are we still not getting as broad and deep a pipeline, a diverse pipeline into industry and keeping them in industry as all of us want? In, you know, uh, there are a whole host of reasons. But let me highlight three of them. Uh, we tend to focus on outcomes too late in the cycle. Uh, the reality is <clears throat> you literally start making an engineer and a scientist in the fifth and sixth grade. Yeah. And they have to be to the point where they are taking algebra, you know, in the eighth or ninth grade to even stand a chance of having enough mathematics requirement in order to be able to get into these, uh, the hard sciences and engineering programs when they hit college, right? And so, uh, so you can't look at the end of the pipeline and say, okay, let's figure out how we get more graduates out of the university. It begins with K-12 partnerships and it begins with industry supporting those partnerships early. By and large, that still hasn't happened enough. You, you will hear uh, companies uh, tell, oh, well, we have this program where we take 7,000 girls in the summer and, you know, yeah, that's great. They actually need more than that, right? Because they, they need more than summer, right? And so uh, for women and for people from underrepresented groups, the context signals, the clues, the, uh, the, the feedback that they get literally from a very young age is that these areas are not areas for you. And we have to come together, both industry and university in an aggressive way to tell them early and often at multiple stages, at every single level, at every single semester. <laughs> it, it can't just be one program for a week. That's great. It's better than not having anything, but that's not going to sustain a kid for a full year. And so in Irvine, we actually developed long tail programs, programs where we started with students in literally in the fifth grade and we had programmatic uh, events and engagements where we touched that student every single year, multiple times per year, all the way up through community college if that's what they chose, right? And then we got to provide, and so, so that's one piece, right? There's just not enough uh, uh, programs in the early stage of the pipeline in order to have enough. Look, the reality is only six to 8% uh, 
of eligible uh, 17 to 24 year olds are grad uh, are coming out of colleges with STEM degrees. So it, it's just not it's just not enough. Yeah. Right. And it, you all you, you know, we took this on as engineering deans. And that's when I uh, in terms of growing, President Obama said, I'm going to challenge you all uh, to add an additional 10,000 engineers. Yeah. We and, and we want you to do it. He wanted us to do it in four years. We did it and we did it in three. And at the end, we, we added 25, 30,000 more. And that still wasn't enough. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. The, 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 the economy still needed more. And we thought, I remember a group of us, we, we thought we had done something. We were sitting there with the folk from the federal government and we said, hey, you asked us to go from 70 to 80,000. We're at 120,000. By golly, we thought we hung the moon. And all of us engineering deans were sitting there smiling because we had increased in the number of graduates by, so, by, by such a great number. And a woman from the Department of Commerce came literally with a stack of job requisitions, right? She said, I need 120,000 today. Yeah. And if all of these graduates you had filled them, I would need more tomorrow, right? <laughs> and so that's <laughs> the level, the scale is just not uh, there yet. And so we have to figure out how we scale that's been the, you know, once we all get this in our psyche, then the programs will be systemic, meaning that they will flow throughout all of our, uh, our disciplines. And, and they will flow literally from elementary school and track all the way through high school and community college. That's when we'll see substantial change on the back end. That's literally what we have to be. Uh, look, fundamentally, we have taught our folk what it means to be smart is to pursue a liberal arts education. Mm. You need to change the concept of that. Mm. What it means to be smart, yes, it's a liberal arts education, but technology is a part of that liberal arts, right? Yeah. We, we need our humanists, we need our artists, we need our English majors to also know how to code. <laughs> we need them to also have an understanding of the built environment so that when they come out, they actually can be, you know, because the critical thinking skills are so high, right? In my opinion, sometimes even higher than the critical thinking skills of engineers, right? Higher than the critical thinking skills of scientists, right? Because they have a usually a more holistic worldview. Those, uh, those students can also be viable contributors to helping solve our, our tech needs and our tech problems. They don't have to you know, have a degree in computer science, but they actually have to understand something about programming. That's what you guys are getting at. Yep. Uh, with many of the programs you're putting in place, I think it's going to have huge success. Uh, you, you mentioned that um, you know the students coming in, they're digitally literate, but they're still um, they've still been told you know for too long that um, that isn't shouldn't be part and parcel of how they think about what they do going forward. And boy, I'll tell you, that's that's just crazy. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're interested in the, you know, I can't tell you how many students I would talk to and I know, and we'll move on, but, you know, who'd come in and, and, and take that first comp sci class and say, everybody else in here has been doing this since they were six. I'm going to ruin my GPA if I keep doing it. And, you know, it's like, well, why didn't we find pathways for those folks that, you know, um, so I, 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 boy, I agree with you. I think the other comment, and again, we'll move on, but you know, it's interesting, the demand side uh, for talent, it's kind of the opposite to the problem of exponential growth that the pandemic showed us. You know, it's just, it's hard to realize how much this demand is growing for this kind of talent. And so mm -hmm. we tend to always just subscale the solutions because we're sort of looking at, you know, that number a year from now and not thinking about what that curve looks like three to five years from now. That's right. Or in, in, in you know, six to 10 years is That's six right. to 10 years is the number, right? When you're talking about fifth grade yeah. and, and you got to have them, you, it, it takes six years for you to get them prepared to even enter the basic training that they need in order to be successful on the back end. It, yeah. it, it is what it is. No, that's great. Well, and there is a big opportunity for, for industry to demystify that, to embrace all that earlier, uh, and to, uh, to celebrate it uh, for, uh, for younger students as well. Um, you know, last year was not just a year of the pandemic. It was also, you know, an overdue year of racial reckoning to some degree for the country. Uh, and of course, um, Mason has its history uh, as oh, yeah. well. 
Yeah. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how you've been dealing with those issues? Um, and again, coming in, boy, I can't even imagine coming in in July in the middle of the pandemic. Um, uh, talk about an extraordinary time in history. Yeah. You, you know, very, very interesting. Uh, the, the, the first question that I was asked as a, uh, you know, as a new president, you know, was not how you're going to deal with the pandemic. It was not, uh, what do you think of the transition from going from California to Virginia? The first question a reporter asked me, they shoved the mic in, in my face and said, uh, George Mason University, George Mason was a slave owner. <laughs> Are you going to change the name of the institution? Yeah, welcome, and welcome, it, it, welcome to your new job. <laughs> exactly. And I'm like, oh. I wasn't ready for that question. I, I literally wasn't. It was it was literally July 1st, my very first day. And I'm talking with a reporter who happened to be on campus for my first day. And that was her first question. And the camera is on me. Oh, man. I, you know, <laughs> this is when you start seeing the, the, the life flash in front of you. You're like, oh, God, what am I going to say? And yet, yet I got through the question. And uh, but then I actually had to go back and start doing some real uh, uh, history and, and started doing some real research into the institution. And uh, I had to be able to answer that question in a, in, in a reasonable manner. And look, the reality is, is that the country has had a, a very, very checkered past when it comes to issues of, uh, uh, you know, fair and equal treatment. It, 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 systemically has excluded people. And that's a part of the country's history. And uh, long story short, when asked what was I going to do about the name, I said, look, we're not going to change the name of George Mason. And, and, and when asked why, I said, look, 12 of the first 18 US presidents owned slaves, 12 of the first 18. And, and nine of them actually had them working at the White House. He had 41 of the 56 signatories of the Declaration of Independence owned slaves. And 25 of the 55 men who wrote the Constitution owned slaves. Slavery was the economic, it was the economic framework of the day during the early founding of the country. The country was founded upon it. There's literally uh, uh, reference to slavery in the constitution. There are references to a whole lot of things, but the three fifths framework is there for a reason. And so uh, when you understand it from that perspective, you know, you, you can celebrate George Mason for the great things that he's done, right? But not commemorate him for the kinds of things, uh, uh, the, for the decisions he made relative to slavery. And so, we look at it at, at, as a holistic approach. This is also a great opportunity for us, for our scholars on campus and for others to actually look at many of the enslaved individuals who actually supported and helped build the campus. So it became a great history lesson to us. And we're putting in, in place a huge uh, memorial uh, to those individuals who were enslaved under George Mason. And we're looking now at their contributions to the uh, to the formation and, and, and the growth of our campus. To me, that's the more positive way of looking at this, right? And it looks at, and, and, and if you expand that to other issues, this is how we look at inclusivity, right? We, everyone has contributed, every race, because of how America is structured, every race, every ethnic group has contributed to the success of this country. We should be about including and celebrating them all. And when you bring everyone to the table and when everyone has a shared uh, uh, benefit because they've actually had a shared sacrifice in what makes this country great, guess what you get? You actually get people working together on the basis of the fact that they have every right to be at the table to begin with, right? And, and so uh, that is kind of core part and parcel to what our inclusive excellence program looks like. This is why we established the Anti-Racism and Inclusive Excellence Task Force to outline initiatives to bring us together on those principles. And, and the group has uh, put together their 
they've had 15 initial recommendations that we are now propagating through the campus and implementing on campus. Uh, look, we were already diverse before it started, especially amongst our students. Uh, the outcomes of this uh, effort will also make us much more diverse in our faculty, our staff, and our administration, and, and thereby bringing everybody in the table as we make decisions going forward. Yeah. Well, thanks. Thanks for sharing that, um, Greg. I think it's really important for everyone to hear about the journey uh, that uh, you and the institution have uh, have been on. Um, we're unfortunately going to run out of time here. Let me ask you a couple of quick things. But sure. um, if, if you could, we, you know, obviously the partnership represents a lot of uh, employers in the region. If you could ask one thing of employers you know, um, to in terms of supporting your your mission going forward, what would that be? That's a great question. Look. Uh, the most important thing companies can do with us is really partner with us. Uh, let's and, and partnership begins with having honest and frank conversations. Company need companies should be willing and open to tell us what they need, and and then should be willing and open for us to say, "Here's what we can give you, and here's what we jointly need to work together." to supply for you relative to the future. And, and what they'll find with Mason is that A, we're flexible, B, we're innovative, and C, we're responsive, right? So we're flexible, we're innovative and responsive. If we don't have what you need, we will work together with you in order to, to get you there. It'll take a little bit of time, but we'll get you there. Eight times out of 10, we're, we probably will have what you need. And, and then we just may need to tweak it on the edges in order to get it into the framework that you need it, right? If you need students with a certain skill set, uh, you know, they might, we, we might have to run them through our Mason Talent Exchange and let them take a short course or two, get a badge in a certain area so that they are, so that their skill set aligns specifically with, with, with your need. Uh, if you have a very, very highly specialized need, well, we might need you to invest in and a faculty member to help that faculty member develop uh, the courseware around that need so that we can then work together to supply students in order to get you that need. But the reality here is that it's, it's about partnership and the greatest thing companies can do with us is just partner with us. Tell us what you need and then work with us to, in order to supply that need to you. Well, as you pointed out, you've got such a diverse um, pipeline at scale that you know you um, you are a really unique um, solution provider, if you will. Uh, on, That's right. On these you issues. know we we can literally put hundreds of students on your doorstep in the ethnic groups, the gender groups that you want, and that's a big feature. That's a that's a big advantage. No question. Last question for you. And uh, Greg, thanks again for, for taking uh, time with us. My guest has been George Mason University's eighth president, Dr. Gregory Washington. But Greg, last question for you. What did you learn about yourself as a leader over the last uh, 10 months, over the last oh, year? Oh, man. That's a tough <laughs> I thought I'd ask the easy one last. For you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I learned two things that. Um, that I'm actually much, I'm, I'm not as fearful of taking on big challenges as I thought I was. Um, when, when, when the pandemic hit and I had to make those critical decisions early, I was surprised with the ease of which I made them, right? It wasn't without a lot of thought. It wasn't without a lot of research. We, you know, we did our homework, but when it came time to make really difficult decisions, and, and I'll be totally honest with you, decisions that if they were wrong could literally lead to me losing my job. I learned that I'm willing to make those decisions and I'm willing to make the decisions that I think are the right ones and not necessarily the ones that are most expedient or the safe ones. You, you, you understand what I'm saying? Because yeah. we had the, this issue of what's safe and what was right. 100%. Right? And, and, and I chose right and not safe. Uh, you can say a lot of things about yourself, right? You know, everybody thinks that their plan will work. You know, when Mike Tyson had a boxing match and he lost to Evander Holyfield, he bit him in his ear. 
uh, <laughs> one of the announcers asked him at the end of the fight, didn't you have a plan? Didn't you know what you were going to do when he got out there with Evander? Why did you fight him in his ear? And Mike Tyson said, look, everybody has a plan until you get hit in the mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, I kind of know how I'm going to respond uh, to those issues now, uh, because this was the greatest challenge that I had to face in my whole academic career. And, and, and while you think you know yourself, you actually don't necessarily know until the challenge is put in front of you. So yeah. that's the answer. Great. Well, I tell you, the, um, the, the, the region is, uh, is fortunate that you brought your right risk taking skills and expertise to it. Um, Greg, thanks so much for the time today. It's been great talking to you. It's been great talking to you. Look forward to seeing you soon. We'll, we'll do that. Great. Thanks again, Dr. Washington, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you.